The observer pattern allows one or more objects to get notified whenever the state changes in some subject that they're interested in. And it's been implemented in a range of ways, sometimes in languages like C Sharp and other times in libraries. But today we're going to go back to the Gang of Four Design Patterns book and we're going to see how we can implement a classic observer pattern in Kotlin. And then we'll look at a few ways that we can modernize it using some of Kotlin's language and library features. So let's jump into some code. Here we've got a class called game, which includes two announcer objects. The first just writes out the current score, and the second tells you which team is currently winning the game. The game class keeps track of the score as just a pair of integers, and I'm using a type alias up here just to avoid having to write out the pair with its type arguments everywhere throughout the code. This score property has a custom setter, and you can see inside it we call a function of each of the announcers to let it know that there's a new score to announce. And finally, we've got a function to increase the score for each team. Since pair is a data class, we can use the copy function on it, as you can see I'm doing here. And running this code is easy. We just instantiate the game. We pass it uh, each of the announcers and then call the functions to update the score as the game progresses. And when we run this code, uh, we can see the two announcers tell us how the game is going at each step along the way. Now, this code is very straightforward. Uh, but it also has a few disadvantages. For example, if we were to add a new announcer class, we'll end up growing the constructor parameters and the setter here would also keep growing. Another problem is related to that one, and that's that the game class is coupled to each of these concrete announcer classes. The observer pattern is designed to work around these issues, so let's see how this code would look in Kotlin uh, if we were to implement it as shown in the classic Gang of Four Design Patterns book. So here's the same idea, just rewritten to use the observer pattern from the Gang of Four book. It includes two main categories of classes. It's got a subject and it's got an observer. And as usual with these design patterns, those two categories also include both abstract types and concrete types. This subject class nicely encapsulates the list of observers, just including the ability to add or detach an observer at runtime. And it also provides this on update function to notify the observers that the state changed. Just a few things changed in this game class. You'll notice that it no longer has any concrete reference to the announcer classes. A one downside here is that we've got to inherit from subject. Like many languages, Kotlin allows only single inheritance, so we get just one opportunity to extend a direct superclass, and we burned that opportunity here. The Design Patterns book gives us a lot of latitude in how we implement an observer, but one of the main characteristics that you'll notice here is that we've flipped the dependency direction. So previously, the game had depended upon the announcers, and now the announcers have a reference to a game object. They attach themselves to the game, as observers happening here in the constructors. And when the game calls their update functions, they reach out to the concrete subject. In our case, that's the game to get the score. Now, again, there's a lot of flexibility in how this pattern can be implemented, but this is kind of like its main configuration. And even though this looks like a lot more code, types like the abstract subject and observer are general enough that you don't really need to duplicate them anywhere. You can just write them once, tuck them away in some library code and just pull them out whenever you need them. So this isn't bad, but still Kotlin has a few language and library features that can be used to modernize the observer pattern. So let's roll up our sleeves and see what we can do. Kotlin's standard library includes a few common property delegates that you can use to wrap a property with extra superpowers. So in our case, I'm gonna replace our custom setter with a property called observable. And this observable function takes the initial value here, and it also takes a lambda that's gonna run each time that the value of the property changes. The lambda parameters include some property information, the old value, and the new value. And since we're not actually using them in this function, we can actually even just use underscores to completely ignore them. Now, next I'm gonna do away with this subject class entirely uh, by just folding its functionality into the game class. And we can do that without too much effort. Now, instead of using the observer type, let's use Kotlin's function types instead. So rather than a list of observer objects, we will accept a list of function types 
Basically, any function that accepts a score and returns a unit could be used here. Instead of an arrangement where the observers have to call back into the subject to get the value, we'll use an arrangement where the subject just pushes the new score out to the observers immediately. Now, we've lost the ability to attach and detach observers at runtime. I suppose we could make the observers property public and mutable if we really wanted to allow attaching and detaching at runtime, but mutable list is, of course, a very overly permissive interface for this kind of thing, so in our case, I'm just going to leave it private. Now, this means we will need that last lambda parameter again because we're going to pass it to the update function. And here inside this lambda, we just call each of our observers in turn. Now, we've also got a few changes to make over here on the observer side. So to start with, since the observers will now get passed into the constructor, they won't need to attach themselves anymore. And now that we're simply using a function type for the observer, we can do away with the observer interface if we want. Now we could keep it, especially as a functional interface, but I'm happy just to rely on this raw function type over here. And finally, now that we're passing the new value immediately when notifying the observers, the update functions get a new parameter and they can reference that parameter instead of the game object. And that means that they don't need a reference to the game object at all anymore. So we can take that out as well. And last, we can just change the way that everything is wired up down here. So let's pass these in as a list of functions. We can run this and we get the same thing as we had before. Now, it's also good to note that since we're passing in function references, these two functions also no longer need to have the same name. There's no interface for them to conform to anymore. They just need to accept a score and return a unit. So an observable delegate property is an easy way to call one or more functions whenever that property's value changes. But when it comes to more complex apps with a rich user interface, Directly calling these update functions might not work well. If they're just printing out a line to the console like we're doing here, not a big deal. But if they're doing a lot of heavy work, we have to make it so that it won't freeze up our app. And so for those cases, we've got other good solutions that work better for an asynchronous world. So let's look at those next. Kotlin has an API named Flow, which uses coroutines to broadcast values over time. This works really well for asynchronous UIs and anywhere that you might reach for a reactive library like RxJava. So to get started, we'll completely change the way that our score property works. So let's remove what we've currently got. And we'll start with a private property whose type is mutable state flow. Now, like all flows, a state flow will emit values over time, but a state flow in particular also allows you to ask for the latest value just by calling the value property. And you can emit a new value by assigning a new value to that value property. Now, we don't want just anyone emitting values from this score flow, and that's why I've made it private. But we do want other objects to be able to observe the state changes. So we're going to make a public copy of it as a non-mutable state flow. If we don't need anyone outside this class to get the current score, we could make this a shared flow instead, but it seems reasonable to me that somebody could want to ask the game for the current score, so I'm gonna put that back. Now, you'll notice inside our two functions here that we're updating the value of score based on the current value, and anytime we do that in an app where multiple threads might try to update it at the same time, it's a good practice to update the value atomically in order to avoid race conditions that would corrode the value over time. So to make an atomic update here, I'm going to use this function named get and update. And we can get rid of the old implementations there. Okay, great. And now that we're using coroutines, we'll need to change the way that we're configuring and running our code. So first we're going to use run blocking so that we can call suspending functions. We'll construct the game before the announcers now. And now that we're using flow, we don't need the old observers anymore up here. So let's take those out. And then we can launch coroutines and start collecting the scores.
and we'll launch the score updates in their own coroutine. Now, if we were to run it like this, we won't see all of the score updates. We're only gonna see the starting one, which is zero to zero. So this is something we didn't see before, but it's gonna show the initial score. And then we also see the final score, which is one to two, where the second team is in the lead. And that's because this whole thing is running single threaded since we're using run blocking and we've never specified any other dispatcher. And because these three uh, updates here all happen one right after another. So to see all of these updates, let's also yield the dispatcher whenever the score is updated. So just in each of these functions, we're gonna come up here, make them suspend functions and call yield. And now when we run this, we are gonna see all the values, including that starting value zero to zero and every step along the way. Now, one last change that we could make over here, uh, these announcer classes don't have any state, so we can just make them top level functions instead. So let's change the way we're doing this. And there we go. So as we saw, Kotlin gives us at least a few different ways to easily get the effects of the observer pattern without needing all of the types that were present in the original design patterns book. Now, speaking of books, I am stoked to share that I've got the second proof of my book, Kotlin, an illustrated guide. Uh, it is finally going to arrive in paperback here in just a few weeks. And so if you'd like to know when it's going to be ready to order, be sure to drop your email address into the waitlist at print.typealias.com and I'll keep you updated about the progress. More videos and live streams are on the way soon. In the meantime, thanks so much for hanging out with me today and I'll see you next time.